and listen. Uh, we um, are going to be talking about the church this morning, which uh, is Christ's body. And um, when I first started here, uh, the church was going the other direction and back that way. And, and you, could, you could look, and about 12, a little bit before 12, like I think I've mentioned before, people started going, I don't want to see any of that. Uh, now it's not a watch, it's a phone. What time is it? You know, and everybody's going, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, I think this reverted back to black. But anyway, the, something happened with the deal. I'm not sure what, what that is, but um, it, it's kind of odd. The, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> the truck, the truck. A, a, we're going to talk about a truck, actually, but we're going to talk about the church. But the truck is what we're going to start out with. Everybody's going, what? Not my truck. It was a rider truck. I think it was a rider truck, if I don't, if I remember right. And uh, Paula and I packed all of our stuff in it, uh, went uh, to places that I knew, and put a, our car, yellow station wagon, Opal 1.9 four-speed, in there, and <laughs> drove to Dallas. We we did not know. Uh, what we were exactly going to do, except I was going to seminary. We didn't have a job, didn't have a place to stay. We didn't even have a place to stay the first time. About three days after we got there, we had to turn the truck in, minus all our stuff that needed to be somewhere, including our car. And does there ever, anybody remember this story? Paul remembers it, maybe. I hope so. A long time ago. And uh, so, sorry about the crunch, crunch. The, the, uh, And so we came to Dallas, and actually we kind of got turned around because we were trying to go down to where the seminary is, right east of downtown Dallas um, on Swiss Avenue. And we ended up down here in this area, actually. We ended up at a motel down here. And we also had to drive around because we didn't, in the truck, because we didn't have our car. It was stuck in the back of the truck because you can't just back the tr car out and go bang on the floor. So we, I, we had to go around trying to find a, a warehouse that had not only a dock but a ramp to get the car back down. And interestingly enough, not too long after we started looking for that, we found one. And, and the people were friendly and we, we, you know, they didn't let us take the truck out. We didn't have to pay them, but, you know, drive the truck, I mean, drive the car down the ramp. And, and God worked that, worked that out. He worked out a place for us to stay at the, at, in seminary housing until we found uh, an apartment right down the street that was $100 a month. And, but we, did, we had to move into one side of, of the hallway because ours wasn't ready yet. And then when it was ready and the people moved out, we moved across all our stuff back across. You know, so it, it, but it all worked out. And <laughs> so... We also left a pretty good church. It was the fastest growing American Baptist church in California at the time. Uh, American Baptist, by the way, if you know uh, Jeremy, that was the, the denomination of the church that they were in when they were in um, by Disneyland there in California. And so anyway, it was a good church, had some issues after we left, like the uh, worship leader uh, being inappropriate with one of the singers and stuff. And they, they got all through all that. My mother... His stepfather uh, went to that church until my, my mom passed away. They both passed away. But it was a good church. And one of the things that we had to do when we came here is find a church. We left a good one. Came to Dallas because that's what we thought God was calling us. But we need to find a church. And, you know, the first few weeks or first, uh, actually, semester, because I was in a class on how to find a church. Well, not exactly, but different churches in Dallas. So we went to a number of different churches in Dallas associated with that class. And, you know, we finally found a church that, that we started to attend and go to in, in, uh, on Garland Road, uh, Reinhardt Bible. Uh, it's now changed to uh, up north, west, up I can't remember, uh, there's a mall thing up there that's named after. But anyway, they moved out of there and then moved someplace else. But we, we had to find a church. And the reason why is because church is important. You know, I just didn't come to Dallas to go to seminary. I came also, it, it, we had to have a, a, a fellowship, a church to go to. Church is important. 
And so, and the, and the idea, the understanding of the church, we have to have that understanding in order for us to kind of know the kind of church that we are going to be looking for. Right now, we're going to be looking, in, all of us are going to be looking for that place that we can serve Jesus in a fellowship and a community. Uh, that, what to look for. But first we have to talk about the church, and that is ecclesiology. Has anybody heard ecclesiology before? That's a Greek term, and it comes from ecclesia, <coughs> which is uh, church. <laughs> no, it's actually, it's actually a, a gathering, an assembly, a called out assembly. Oftentimes it was used a sec in a secular sense for uh, calling out the people of the community to come to make decisions. It was somebody, it's, it was a gathering together. It, and it came to mean, as the New Testament pr pr progressed, the church, the way that we kind of understand it now. And so when you see ecclesia in the New Testament, or you see church in the English, it's almost always ecclesia, or a derivative of, of that. It comes from the word kaleo, which means to call, or to call out, or to call to come. Uh, and there's essentially two ways to look at ecclesia in the New Testament, two ways to look at church. Uh, the first way is the local church, okay? The, the, the local church is like the church that we have here. It's a local church. Uh, in Acts uh, 2.41, you see the beginning of the church as the, the Holy Spirit at Pentecost came down and dwelled the believers and church started. All right, so then those who had received his word were baptized so that the day, so that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Now, this is specifically a uh, descriptive, you know, descriptive, not necessarily prescriptive, although. I think Luke is using it as an example of the beginning of the local church. It's interesting, the first local church was a megachurch, you know, where, where we think about a megachurch. 3,000 people one day came to Jesus and were baptized and came to be part of that first local church. And you see this church concept, uh, that, such as the church in Rome, uh, Paul did not uh, start that church, but he wrote a letter to it. Uh, church at Thessalonica, church at Philippi, the church in Lydia's house was, was at Philippi, uh, and so forth. And, and so you see Paul writing to churches. Uh, you see also uh, Jesus writing to churches. We'll look at that just briefly a little bit later. As, as we look at what a church is, what ecclesia is, there are certain characteristics that you see. The first one is a local community of baptized believers. Oh, okay. Now, I come from a Baptist background. Uh, well, after I came from a Methodist background. But I, when I became a Christian, I, I went to a Baptist church. And so I was baptized. I was baptized by immersion. I think that's the way that people, people should be baptized. I was baptized as an infant in uh, Poplar, California, which I don't even remember, you know, when I was little as in the Methodist tradition. But after I became a Christian, after I received his word, received Jesus, I was baptized. Okay, and, and why would I say that it's a, 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 a local church is a body, a community of baptized believers? Because that's what it says. After they received the word, they were baptized. Okay, and so that, that is a, a reality when you look at the origin of the beginning of ecclesia, the beginning of church. They're baptized believers that are that are come together in a local church. Now it doesn't have to be three thousand. You know, it's like you count three thousand people and that's it. You have to start another one from, from three thousand more. But but three thousand were there baptized. Man, that must have been a big, huge baptismal service. But anyway, they were baptized believers, and they had qualified leaders. Now, who were the qualified leaders then? The apostles. Who, who chose them? Jesus. Okay, he chose Jesus. Jesus chose the apostles to start his church. It's late, it's the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and maybe Peter, but we won't get into that exactly today. But 
It doesn't mean, however, there's apostolic succession, because if there was apostolic succession in terms of uh, what, for instance, the Roman Catholic tradition is, there would be a whole bunch of successions because it would start with 11 or maybe 12 if you add Matthias, and we'd have a succession all the way down. So it, it didn't, it's not that way that, that you find elders, you find leaders in the church, you see Paul addressing that later. Okay, so they had qualified leaders. In, in Titus 1.5, Paul addresses uh, Titus, his uh, pastor or his legate, his representative that he's sending to, to a church, to this area in Crete. He says, this is why I sent you there, is to appoint elders in every city and to set things in order. So they had qualified leaders that were in order. And you see the further qualified leaders in 1 Timothy 3. So a couple of different lists of what qualifies leaders as churches in churches. And teaching. Because they would they devote themselves to? The apostles teaching. So there's teaching in a church. There, there's in 1 Timothy 4, it says, teach these things. Preach and teach these things. And there's sacraments, just like we had today. The breaking of bread, fellowship and breaking of bread. I think it's both, both are in that concept of fellowship and breaking of bread. Is there, they had uh, sacraments. Some people add uh, different other ones uh, to, to that, like foot washing. We don't do that here. I've been involved in foot washing ceremonies. We don't do that here. But there are sac sac sacraments, not in the Catholic sense, but in kind of the you know what I mean since. And there was prayer, all right? There was prayer. Now, some people say, well, you can have a church, just, you know, a couple of people in your living room just kind of kind of discussing, you know, current events and scripture, and that's a church. Uh, not really. That's not a New Testament concept of what ecclesia is. There's certain things in ecclesia Okay, there's baptized believers, there's leadership there, there's a sac the, the, the coming together in fellowship to do sacraments, and there's prayer together. You might have one or two of those things, but essentially if you don't have those things, you don't have church. And so that's what church is, that's ecclesia. And that concept goes all the way through the New Testament down to today. And the second way church is used is the Universal church. Now, we're not talking about Unitarian Universal. We're talking about universal here. That means everybody. For instance, in 1 Thessalonians, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Why do I use that? Because that's the first time the universal church is going to meet together. You know, some of the people of the universal church are not here alive, but they're part of the universal church, live like here. Part of the universal church. And when Christ comes, the whole universal church will arise with him and live with him forever. Now we get some kind of... <clears throat> glimpses of that universal church with Christians and churches all over the place, all over the world, right? You know, we have, we have Christians and we have no Christians. Uh, we talked about today. Where are they going? Down here in o Oaxaca. Uh, who's, who's over here? Huh? Grashas are over here in Papua New Guinea. New Guinea is uh, this whole area here. Part of, it, so part of this is Indonesia. The other part is Papua New Guinea, a different country. Uh, I don't know anybody in Australia. Oh, I've got some cousins in Australia, but I don't know them. Anyway, there, and, and we have somebody that's uh, up, up right in here. Who's that? Oh, Kaylee. Kaylee up, is in right now is in Nepal, right? And we have others that are various places, some in the United States, others various places. I know missionaries in Liberia. Yes? Do we have anyone in Antarctica yet? In who? Antarctica. No, I think we'll... Leave that to Jesus. Anyway, <laughs> the, so but you know and I, I do. I know missionaries that are that are in uh, Africa. Uh, I, I know <clears throat> some that are at a seminary in uh, Monrovia. Some that are in a Baptist uh, mission in in uh, Monrovia that that does do a lot of missionary things. So there's local church all over the place. And when we've visited different places, you kind of know 
people that are believers and part of that universal church. Even though you're part of a local church, we're also part of the worldwide global universal church. We've been a church in Great Britain. Went to a low, uh, how do how I say that? Low church, say Anglican low church, not the high church, but low church. That it's kind of more evangelical, and it's you know that there's two churches kind of in England. But anyway, and, and there there was a sense of community that we were all part of the church. Same way in, in, in Africa, same, same way we've gone to different churches in, in here in the United States as we kind of traveled around. Church in California, church in, up in Oklahoma, down the uh, Methodist church actually down south that was very evangelical. I thought they were going to have an altar call. So, you know, it's, it's like the universal church is everywhere, but it's also those that have gone before. And Jesus is the one who builds his church. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this church, I will, on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. He's talking about the universal church here, okay? That, that Satan is not going to overcome what, what God is doing through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. Now, however how you understand uh, Peter and the rock and all that kind of stuff, um, really doesn't matter at this point. That's not what I'm trying to focus on. The focus is who is the head of the church. P Peter? No. Nah. You know, he was foundation, what? Apostles and prophets. It's Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. It's his church. Not my church, not your church in this sense. Not somebody else's church. You know, not Swindoll's church. Okay. Not anybody's church here. It's Jesus' church. No matter what church you go to, if they're believers in Jesus Christ, it's a body of baptized believers that have those parts of that kind of the, of the church that are there. It's Jesus' church. And he will build it. It's his body. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Think about that, because that's serious. As a church of Jesus Christ, we're part of his body. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do not share on behalf, I, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Or you can have a whole theological discussion on Christ's lacking, how that works as God. But what he's saying is that Christ came, died, and rose again. But there's still more stuff and work to do here. Just like Jeremiah said, there's still service. You know, we can wait for Jesus. It, it, but that's not what we're called to do. You know, that's not what Paul is called to do as he writes to the church in Colossae. I do what I can, building up the body of Christ. And it's Christ's body, not mine. Sometimes it loses perspective. Sometimes the church loses the perspective that it ought to have. In uh, 1 Corinthians, it's one of the classic losing perspectives. Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, that you be made complete in the same mind, in the same judgment. Their perspective was being split. Oh, I, I follow, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow whoever. And some of the real spiritual ones says, I follow Jesus. And Paul is saying, you, you lost the perspective. The perspective is Jesus. The focus is Jesus. It's not your church. It's not your leader. It's Jesus. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the what? Gospel. Christ died for our sin, was raised on the third day, and by faith we have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I sent that, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. What's the, what is the focus? The cross of Christ and what Jesus did. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is not really another, but only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. 
you guys lost the perspective. In fact, I, I, Paul's saying, you, you've almost lost salvation here. Your focus is on the law instead of on Jesus. You know, you think you have to be a Jew before you become a Christian. And Paul is saying, you lost it. That's not how it works. You become a Christian by faith in Jesus. And by the way, sanctification too. <clears throat> Jesus' message to some of the churches in Revelation. You know, Jesus is talking, you know, because it's red letters. You're lukewarm. You've lost your first love. You allow evil and idolatry to enter. You've lost that perspective. Who's supposed to be here? Jesus, not these folks. A focus on wealth instead of a focus on Jesus. <clears throat> that stuff never happens today. Jesus is the head of the church. We talked about it before in Colossians. He's also the head of the body, the church, and he is beginning the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. You know, part of what the church is doing as we move forward is so Jesus has first place. <clears throat> Not in our own lives, but around us. Because our perspective is Jesus. And then, you know, it's this. <clears throat> I think it'd come up here. Yeah. And some of us, you know, I mentioned wealth. You might think, well, that's what he's talking about. But that's not really what I'm talking about. Here, when you see a church, and when Paul looks at a church, he's got elders, they are to be supported. Okay? The elders who rule well will be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. It's probably talking about also church ministries that they're involved in. And what, what am I talking about here? Guess what? I can talk about it now because it, right now it's not, it's not my deal anymore. You know, if we go out to different churches, it means we support them with our money. That the elders that are there, that are working hard at teaching and preaching and caring and pastoring, they deserve double honor. You know, some people say you, you have a church, you have the, you know, the average of the church, what their income is, you double it, and that's what you pay the elders. I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that, but I'm just giving an example of what kind of Paul is saying. They're worthy of that. may not get it, but they're worthy of it. So they need support. Leaders should be supported. Obey your leaders and submit to them. For they keep watch over you as your souls. For those who will give account, let them do this with joy, not grief. For this would be unprofitable for you. If leaders of churches are all the time having to deal with issues and, and grief because people are not listening, it's hard. Fortunately, by the way, I haven't had that too much. You know, when that happens, usually people leave, which is nice. I, I shouldn't say that. I'm, I'm, I'm bad. I'm going to be hit with lightning. Well, what does this say? It's like, Paul's almost like saying, who do you guys think you are? Obey your leaders. You know, this, this isn't like just, you know, think about what they say. This is actually obey your leaders. Now, I can say this again strongly because this, you know, it's not going to involve me much longer here, maybe somewhere else, and then I have to preach it again. But anyway, I mean, not that I'm going to be pastoring someplace, but maybe somebody will ask me to preach, and I'll say the same thing. Obey your leaders. Watch over your, they watch over your souls. Now, yeah, that's the church. And the church, you know, helps us by the way. <laughs> we, Jesus set it up so that it can help us, building and equipping. He gave some as apostles and prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, for the building up of the body of Christ until we attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature man, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Wow. That's the whole context. It's about building, about equipping the church. It's about encouragement. And news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. And they sent 
Barnabas off to Antioch. Well, what happened is that people have gone to Antioch, preached Jesus, and people have come to Christ. They started a church. And so the, the leaders in Jerusalem sent Barnabas, because who was Barnabas? Son of disaster, no, son of encouragement. So they sent Barnabas off down there to, then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. It's interesting. Encouragement, preaching, the word, gospel, considerable numbers come to Jesus. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Yep. What does that mean? Be part of a church if you're a Christian. Period. Don't be, don't be doing all the, oh, I can do it virtually. I mean, if you're sick and you can't go, that's fine. But I'm ta talking about people just want to sit on their behind the person thing. And, and just, I can be a part of the church just by watching TV. Now, like I said, if you're sick and it's hard for you to get out, you're homebound, whatnot, I, you know, I understand that. But people that are health, healthy, I mean, I can make it up here. Paul Walker, you know, he makes it up here. Praise God. You know, and that means assembling ourselves together. You go to another church, it means go to it. Help us grow. For him we proclaim and admonish every man, teaching every man so that every man is complete in Christ. For this purpose I also labor, striving according to the power which mightily works within me. You guys uh, probably saw the, the boo-boo on my head, right? You know what I did? I told you, some of you. I came over here Friday, you know, Debbie said don't come over here on Thursday because it was icy. So I obeyed Debbie and came on Friday <laughs> instead. And so, and so I go out there and I get in the midst of the walk up to the stairs and it's icy. Man, I start sliding around, you know, and I'm doing the ice skating routine. And, and, I, you know, and I almost made it over there, you know, and I'm going, I can, I can make it to the, to the thing, to the ramp with the pipe thing on top of this. Yeah, yeah that. <laughs> I'm trying to forget the whole thing, the rail. And so, and I'm on, and I'm, and I, I'm not, I, I've got it, you know, and what happened is I, I've got it, bam, man, my head, head hit that ramp, oh. and I was going, Yeah, you got two AA batteries. Yeah, but it's really at the end. Yeah, just get two batteries. We'll work on it. Uh, we're, we're got, don't have much, don't much longer here, so. Are any, any of you looking at your watch yet? No. Okay, so we're checking. Um, encouragement. But, but the illustration, that was an illustration, okay. We got sidetracked on the illustration. But... <laughs> But it, it's, it's like I've learned a lot of things in my life, w wisdom wise, you know, and, and, and sometimes life teaches us, sometimes other people teach us, like Debbie.
Never had that happen, I don't think. Anyway, um, but if I would have listened, you know, if I would have listened to the admonishment, you know, and Debbie admonished me, don't come here. You know, if I would have been mature, I would have looked at that ice and I said, I'm going home. That's what I'm doing. But no. Or, or one of the things that I was thinking about, and it happens a lot of times, you know, you, you think you've got it, and boy, I thought I had it. I had my hand on that rail. And that's when disaster happens sometimes. You know, we're, we need to make sure that we are really walking forward, you know, in the tree. Sometimes when we think we have it, we don't. And it's like we're never going to be totally mature on this world, by the way. That's later. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen, you take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every act might be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church, Tell who? The church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile or tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Who does the binding and loosing? Declaring those things. The church. The church is involved in correction, and, and you know, the, what actually happened is the church building was involved in my correction, but the church is involved in correction, okay? That's part of it. it and so it, it, and Jesus laid it out. You know, this is, how you, this is how you handle this stuff, because people in the church are going to sin. You know, Jesus is not saying the church is going to be perfect, they're never going to have any problems, everybody's going to be walking with Jesus. No, it says there's, there's, there's times that people are going to sin. And this is how you deal with that. It shows the unbeliever Jesus. This, we talked about this before. Say, Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and the ungifted men or believe, unbelievers enter, they will, will they not say you are mad? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all as he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring God is certainly among you. What's the among you? The church. What's happening? Unbelievers coming in the door. Now, I'm not, we're not going to talk about tongues and prophecy and all that, how that works together, but the point is what Paul is saying, y'all are, are, are talking and, and making a big ruckus that nobody can understand, all right? And, and if, you're, if you're talking, every, one person comes with, some, with a, a, a statement or a, a prophecy because they didn't have the Bible yet, where pe and that's where people can understand. They're talking the language that people can understand, even either Aramaic or Koine Greek, depending, because I think they're, most of them are bilingual. But what was happening is the unbelievers come in, and they, they thought the Corinthians were absolutely nuts because they couldn't understand the thing they were saying. But what should have been happening is they should have been showing Christ to the people so they come to Jesus. Instead, they were, throw, they were showing confuse, confusion and craziness. And, that's what, and Paul, you know, for him and her, his time and all that, you know, he, he said, hey, I speak in tongues more than y'all. It's not the, not the issue here. The issue is people are coming into the church and they're not seeing Jesus. They're seeing you being stupid. Stop it. And so what does that tell us? The church proclaims Jesus. The church shows the unbelievers Jesus and makes sure when people come in the door, they see Jesus. They don't see something else. That's part of the church. The church is his body. Be like Jesus. So unbelievers are drawn in. So, what to look for in a local church and a place to serve? First of all, a focus on Jesus. Good news is evident. There's not a hobby horse going on. By the way, one of the hobby horses going on that sometimes goes on in certain churches, especially from the, biblical, the Bible church, um, more so 20 years ago than now, 
was something that Jeremiah was talking about. We're, you know, we're just focusing on Jesus' return. That's a hobby horse sometimes. There's other hobby horses people can get on. There's a big hobby horse recently, last couple of years, over re, uh, Reformed Church. Oh, I'm Reformed. I'm new Reformed, and that's a focus on Reformed, and everybody's Reformed. I don't want to be Reformed. You guys are loose, lost your focus. I'll probably get lightning for that, too. Care, care about all aspects of Jesus. You know, so, some people just pick and choose. The biggest, one of the biggest ones that, that, that is continual. Judge not. Jesus says don't judge. Well, yeah, he did say that, but he also said right in the same passage, lest you be judged. The idea is that you've got to make sure that you, the moat's out of your eye before you take the moat out of somebody else's eye. Judgment in itself is not what, the, what Jesus is talking about. Jesus, the whole thing Jesus is talking about, not just one aspect, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. No, he never talked about rape either. But he sure said that marriage is between a man and a woman. Call all aspects of Jesus. Preach and teach the word. Pray. That's what you're looking for in church. Theology. Real quick. Triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do they believe in the Trinity? The scripture, God's word is valued. It's not devalued. It's not, we, we talk about everything but the Word. I was in a church in California I grew up with. They talked about everything but the Word. And when you ask them about something in the Word, they went somewhere else. They didn't care about what God said. That's one of the reasons I walked away into agnosticism. Leadership is qualified. Not just the guys that have the most money, but they're qualified people that love Jesus. Preaching is expository. What that means is that the preaching is, is um, around the Word of God. It doesn't mean that you have to go verse by verse through every, on everything, but if they don't do verse by verse sometimes, you know, if you look back at their sermons, you know, have a, go on the website and look back at their sermons, it's everything else but going through the Word. Book of James, we're going through the Book of James. We're looking th through Matthew. And if they do do topical sermons, is it contextual to the scriptures? Or they just take a, a, a scripture and just go off everywhere else? Where in the world did you go? I mean, I, it's like, we're, let's go, try to find the scripture passage in here somewhere. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus. Not other stuff, okay? Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus. Sanctification is also by faith, not by rules, not by law, but by faith. A changing of the character of the person into the very image of Jesus by the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit specifically. Members are faithful to Jesus and his church. Members are happy to be there. Go in some churches, not, you know, not usually not the ones we pick out to go to when we're gone, but... Go in some church. Uh, I've just got to go to church because that's what's expected. It's not so much today. It used to be that way, but not so much today. But sometimes people just, you know, they're not real happy to be at church. Makes me wonder why. And they're happy that you're there. Okay? If you walk into the church and they're like, who are you? That's not a good deal. You, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know if I want to be here either. <laughs> Happy that you're there, and the church is compatible with your needs, okay? That's the last one, the only one I, I numbered. That's part of it. You know, some of the demographics in terms of maybe you're older and you want some older folks around, or maybe younger, we'll have kids, you know, and stuff, or whatever. It's not mine to tell you what your, your, your needs are, but, that, but that's last, you know, it, it, you don't go put that at the beginning and then, well, maybe if they, you know, they, they preach the scriptures, you know, maybe it, but that's secondary. No, that's all first. Now, here are some, some illustrations of religious groups not to join. I think you might agree. Unitarian Universalist? No, nah, that's not a Christian group. I got one over here on Keys. Next to a church is fairly good, by the way. Islamic Mosque? 
there's, I think the closest one is in Irving, but anyway, the Buddhist temple, got one right down the street, by the way, down the Ledbetter, turn right there, real pretty. Baha'i, there's one over by where we used to live, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, okay? But those are like not Christian. And you, you all know that. The church that supports sin. Now, there may be Christian churches that support sin. Now, what do you mean by that? 50 years ago, not so much today, but 50 years ago, they didn't want any blacks in their church. Sin. Right up there on that wall. Right up there. See it? That's the end of the pew. There's people that gave to the pews. You know what's up there? We've repented of it a long time ago. There's some Ku Klux Klan members on that thing. I don't know which ones, but there's people that I knew that were older that started this church that said that person and that person was a person in the Ku Klux Klan. And we repented of that. We probably should have taken that sign down, but I don't know. There's some other people that are up there that were very good. Fifty years ago, that was sin. Sin today, there's a church. You know, that, I'm, that's an example of something that was 50 years ago. That's not so much today. Today, it's affirming this gay marriage. Okay, just this week, church in outside of Atlanta, a pastor saying, hey, you know, our gay members, supposedly evangelical church, our gay members are, are, are more faithful than our straight ones. Oh, really? Sorry. That's sin. Now, it's not to say that, you know, that a gay person can't come in here. They're struggling. They're, you know, they're, they're walking with Jesus, and they're struggling just like everybody else. That's different. But I'm talking about somebody that's affirming gayness. It's okay to be trans. It's okay to be gay. No. That's sin. Okay? That's sin in the Old Testament. It's sin in the New Testament. Period. Probably not. No church is perfect. But here's a few examples of possible ones. These aren't recommendations. I learned a long time ago not to make recommendations. People would ask me for a recommendation of a plumber or whatever. I'm not making a recommendation. You know, this guy I used once, but I'm not recommending him because I, you know, every time, well, almost every time I did that, I get in trouble for some reason. I charge too much. They didn't do that. I don't make recommendations anymore, <laughs> but these are some possible, these are the churches like this. Some examples, of, and these are in order, by the way, Faith, Faith Bible Church in DeSoto, okay, um, Fellowship Church in, in Dallas off 75, I've been, I've been there. Uh, First Baptist of Duncanville, I haven't been there, but I know, know a little bit about it. Hillcrest Baptist in Cedar Hill. Uh, by the way, their old place where they used to be is Concord over here. Uh, Irving Bible Church, Kessler Community Church, that's a small church up in, uh, off of Hampton, uh, uh, just past Fort Worth Avenue. Uh, a couple of our members went here to help establish that church. Um, what's that? Kessler Community Church. Um, Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship uh, over on, uh, Camp, on uh, Camp Wisdom. Uh, by the way, that was the original location for. You know where Faith Bible Church started, by the way? It started in a community center in Oak Cliff, moved to where Faith to Oak Cliff Bible Church is now, and then bought the property in DeSoto. Watermark Community Church up in North Dallas. You know, again, none of these are perfect, and they're, I'm not recommending in any of them. They're just examples. All of them have issues. Waxahachie Bible Church, uh, Midlothian Bible Church. Many of many, usually if they have Bible Church in them, it's probably okay because we're Bible Church, so they're okay. <laughs> so, what am I talking about? 
go out. Now, not right now. We have a few weeks, and we have a lot of stuff to do. Not right now, but go out. I know it's hard to find a church. I know uh, we went to Reinhardt for a long time. Then we decided to come to another one, this one. Um, it's hard to find a church. Peter, Paul, and his wife, Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, Epaphras, Priscilla and Aquila, Apollos, Phoebe, and so forth. All of them went out. All of them, all of them. It's a kind of a Christian deal to go out. Go out, seek and join a church that loves Jesus and is following him in order to serve and to grow and witness about Jesus. So anyway, I know it's a, uh, I think there's more of them now. There we go. I know it's a little late. Is there any questions?